Hello humans! Welcome back to the Elementals Project, where I, a starry-eyed Tolkien head and chaotic neutral gardener, have painted every element in the periodic table as a fantasy creature, and I'm bringing you along for the ride. Come July or August, we're going to produce the entire thing as a oracle deck or flashcard deck if you want to use it to learn hard science. It's going to have a book companion, it's going to be so freaking cool. And in the meantime, if you want to buy the poster, that's in my Etsy shop. If you want to buy an individual favorite element, those are also there. If you don't see the one you want, drop me a note or go to my website. Is that everything you need to know? Yeah. Okay. So these videos are focusing on the elements in their groups, you know, because each column has got its own sort of family traits. And we have already hit on... We've already hit on... We started with the alkali metals, we followed up with the alkali earth metals, and then we did a little bit of rare earths, which are, are all uh, amphibians in this deck. And we have made it as far as the reptiles now. Starting with, of course, Titanium! Needs no introduction. Not only is he one of the most widely known pure elements, but he is also one of the 30-something who has his own video already. I made it all the way up to bromine doing these individually and by number, and then I hit a wall. These group videos are my way to climb over the wall. But if you'd like to see this particular time lapse with no jumps, and listen to me wax eloquent about life and death and stuff, that video is here. But I can, in this video, at least tell you that my original concept for this column was orcs. And I sometimes kind of wish I'd stuck with that because it would have been fun. But inspiration beat me upside the head with these anthropomorphic reptiles and it seemed like a good idea at the time. There are so many orcs out there, but how many golf club wielding crocodiles are there? <laughs> That's right. Not enough. My notion for how to get the scales done was a bit mm, rudimentary. I'm sure there are better ways of doing these things, and probably tons of YouTube how-to videos, but that never occurs to me in the moment. I am not against learning fresh techniques from other people. Far from it! But that isn't what I gravitate towards. Here I'm changing the shape of the airplane painted on his chest to signify both that titanium is used in airplane parts, and to showcase the white paint, which is of course another important titanium application. And then scales. Ugh, oh, scales for days. I thought this was terribly grueling, but I had no idea what I was in for when I got to zirconium. Oh, you sweet summer child, look at you, happily tripping toward the gates of hell. As I do these abridged versions, I find it not at all intuitive to decide what to keep and what to cut. Thank you for your patience as I navigate these waters. I'm sure by the time we get to the P-block I'll be an old pro at it. But for now, it's a struggle. So sometimes you may be like, Oh, shit, I would have liked to see that bit, but now it's just magically done. Or conversely, why are we still watching this tedious part? And to that, all I can say is... Leave your complaints in the comments. I will read them all and be happy you bothered. Here we add more white paint accents because without them he was looking kind of bland. I don't want to add more clothing and he needs very few accessories aside from the near invisible nose piercing and I couldn't resist giving him a black box which I always assumed was, you know, black. But my Google search proved me wrong. Who knew? My watchword for titanium is imperviousness, because, although it is a strong metal, it isn't the strongest. And although it is hard, it isn't the hardest. Nor is it the least reactive. That title goes to cold. But it is in the top tier of all of those traits, and that is what makes it special. It can be used in hip replacements, which would be a terrible idea with gold. <laughs> and in hypoallergenic piercings, and of course, expensive golf clubs. He is a household name, and he deserves to be. Moving on. Ah, zirconium. Zirconium has such diverse uses, because on the one hand, its oxide can be easily persuaded to form gorgeous gemstones of every color, which are inexpensive and beautiful, and on the other hand, it is still a rough, manly transition metal, which is used in various alloys, as well as abrasive discs for angle grinders. How does one reconcile such disparate jobs? Why, with a chameleon, of course. Tough yet colorful. It was perfect. I just needed to get the texture right, and after some experimenting, the perfect tool turned out to be one of these things, dipped in paint, over and over and over again. 
This is me avoiding that for as long as humanly possible, getting shadows established and colors blocked in. His tail was a bit awkward. I did some sketches and it turns out that when you curled its tail the wrong way, a chameleon just doesn't look like a chameleon anymore. So, it's the wrong call even though it's easier. The tail worked out well, but it was the hardest thing about turning him into a chibi. <laughs> That's right, like radium, zirconium was another elemental I made into one of the nerdy crafter figurines. I even tried to make the process into a short, but it got hard, and I put it on semi-permanent hold. Speaking of hard, these scales, oh my gods, they took days. I would do a bit and then stop when my hand started cramping. And you're not seeing me dip it in paint because I am a merciful person and that footage at this speed would give anyone an instant headache, but just take my word for it, this process sucked. <laughs> The background needed to be darker. He was blending in, and that's the opposite of what we're going for, and working on his accessories gave me a much-needed break from skin texture. Funnily enough, I used that exact same technique to add scales to the chibi sculpture version, stamping it into the sculpey. I wish I could show you the video, but the thing is I took too much footage, and then I crashed the editing program I was trying to use, and I can't use Adobe Premiere for it because the version that I have doesn't recognize vertical format as an option. So the whole thing was just grueling and frustrating, so I stopped. For now. Like Titanium, I wanted him to have somewhat of a barbarian aesthetic, with requisite loincloth and leather straps and studs. At the same time, it shouldn't just be his colorfulness that illustrates his sparkly decorative side, so a necklace of daisies will have to be added. After the angle grinder, of course. I put it off because at first I wasn't sure what kind of flowers would be the most zirconium appropriate. I actually fell down several different rabbit holes looking for a clue. I thought, well, zirconia is a birthstone, right? So I'll use the flower for the same month, hey! But it turns out that birthstone Stones are a marketing gimmick from the early 20th century, trading on ancient but vague superstition to sell stones that jewelers otherwise had trouble shifting. Also, there are several lists, some of which have a different color of zirconia as the stone for every month. So that was interesting, but not at all useful. Ultimately, I chose daisies because that was what I saw in my head. If you know a better reason, tell me and I'll gladly retrofit. <laughs> Onward! Hafnium. My beloved Book of the Elements by Theodore Gray, website linked below, points out that Hafnium is absolutely essential to plasma cutters, so I leaned into that. He is a Komodo dragon with a sword, and his handle is Dissever, meaning sever. I am wishing that I'd worked harder to make these backgrounds more interesting. As it is, I merely tried to create interesting textures which would carry through each group as yet another reminder of where everything belongs, but there's no real logic to them, and some of them repeat because I simply did not have 34 background-worthy patterns in me. Some of the elements have just a tiny bit more detail going on, and I think those look so much better. More grounded. <sighs> Speaking of texture, I was on a mission to replicate the look of a Komodo dragon and found that their skin may look deceptively simple, but holy moly, there are so many layers and colors and stuff. Shades of gray and tan and darker gray all mottled together like lichen. And on top of all this, he also had to look like a professional strongman because Hafnium is, like its siblings, a very tough. The foreshortening was a bitch, but photo reference was my friend. Let's take a moment and appreciate the existence of the Google image search. I am lucky enough to belong to the generation that remembers having to dive into the card catalog at the library and riffle through the non-fic shelves and consult with the Dewey Decimal Oracle to access pictures I can now find with the push of a button. We are called Gen X, the Hobbit generation, even early millennials but those of us who had parents that were into metaphysics remember that what we really are is the indigo children. <laughs> I'll leave a comment if you remember that one. More texture, dear gods. The thing about Komodo dragons is that their scales really do have a perceivable pattern. And if that's missing, it looks wrong. But if it's too obvious, that also looks wrong. I'm trying to focus on that while also not losing sight of the main point, which is that he must personify Hafnium. 
a hard, durable metal that sheds electrons at an astonishing rate when prompted, which is why it works so well in plasma cutters. It is the electrode which starts the process and can maintain its integrity even under the high temperatures it's subjected to. Oh, do not get attached to, to this color on the loincloth. It takes me a few tries to get it right. Bear with me. The sword is an obvious representation of the plasma cutting shindig because I like clear metaphors as much as the next guy. One of Hafnium's traits is that it anodizes into beautiful colors, and though that's not exactly unique, I wanted it represented. It takes me a while to get it right, of course. <laughs> the tricks I would use on a cosplay piece don't work on a painting like this. The translucence is harder to simulate, and oh dear gods, the green! <laughs> I wanted something that would stand out, but wow. Business from the waist up, party from the waist down, am I right? Ultimately, I think he turned out all right. Memorable, which is the important thing. If you saw him elsewhere, you'd know who he was. I picture his scabbard on his back when he's not flexing for art. Finally got the loincloth looking right, gotta deepen those shadows somewhat, and off we go. Ah, Rutherfordium. Before I learned all these periodic table facts, when all I had was the shower curtain, Rutherfordium was my favorite. It just sounds so fussy and polite, you know? Titanium sounds epic, and zirconium sounds alien, and hafnium sounds aggro, but Rutherfordium just sounds British. It turns out, though, that Rutherford was, in fact, from New Zealand, born in 1871, and is considered the father of nuclear physics, hence the namesake. Now, by this point in the table, the elements are all radioactive as well as synthetic. Several of them do have uses, mostly in cancer-fighting medicine. Rutherford is not one of these. It exists only briefly when it is synthesized, and its only function is academic. It also gave competing nuclear research labs in the U.S. and Russia something to argue about for decades. <laughs> the thing about Rutherford is... Before him, scientists thought the atom was indivisible. That is, in fact, where the atom got its name. But this guy designed an experiment that proved that an atom is mostly space, but with a tiny, heavy center. He discovered and named protons and neutrons. He was the first to differentiate between alpha and beta radiation. And on top of all that, he worked really well with others. Everyone agrees he was just such a nice guy. I really chose well when I picked his element as my favorite, even if I didn't know it at the time. Everything beyond plutonium is synthetic, and I decided to encode that information by giving all those elements a cyberpunk aesthetic. This turns out to be hella difficult for me. And in Rutherfordium's case, for example, he definitely turned out steampunk instead. <laughs> My friends assure me that this works, because after all, Rutherford lived in late Victorian times, so it sort of makes sense. But I think they're just being kind. In any case, even if he is the wrong punk, he looks great, so I have no intention of changing him. He can be the exception. Kind of like how all the known since antiquity elements are elderly, except for arsenic, and it's going to stay that way because I like her the way she is. Sorry, not sorry. It also seemed to me that as far as reptiles are concerned, a tortoise would be a good fit for this guy. He is named for someone both thorough and methodical, and the tortoise can represent those qualities while also alluding to his place as the final member of Group 4. Oh, I love those rivets. I tried to make his overbite look a bit mustache-like, and his original orcishness can be seen in his massive build. And, of course, this is the element I was talking about when discussing my dissatisfaction with rubidium. Rutherfordium has a much more compelling reason to have a magnifying glass, representing, as he does, the concept of investigation. My idea for the seat was a bit late in coming. It was going to be a stump, but that was... Uh, meh. I ultimately gave him this globe to sit on. And I was careful to make sure that the landforms peeping out from behind his leg is, in fact, New Zealand. They have a memorial to him there, in Brightwater. A bronze sculpture of Rutherford as a boy, running, clutching a mathematics book in his hand. It's very poignant. 
and it's being referenced here by the book next to him as I needed somewhere to put his symbol. And we're home free. And that's group four in the back. I always forget to say, if you like what I do, please join my Patreon. Link's in the description. We have a lot of fun, and there's behind the scenes and rewards and stuff. We're moving toward a Kickstarter to publish the Oracle deck and book together. I'll keep you posted here, or you can follow me on Amazon. On Amazon? <laughs> I'll keep you posted here, or you can follow me on Instagram. Our next video, we'll be trekking deeper into the D block. Pull on your boots and stretch your hammies. And until then, be strong. Pay attention to your textures. Look closely at the little things and stay healthy. Tough Why and easy. You know, I had the worst time trying to figure out I the flower. Some... Ultimately, it's because a daisy is what I saw. People can work it out themselves. Someone somewhere is going to be like, oh, it's a daisy because, and it'll be something incredibly clever that I didn't know, and I'll be like, exactly. yeah, that. It's funny because I put them outside, oh, and they yeah. were, and yeah, and they were out for like 30 seconds, and I turned my back, and your dad let them back in. I think he thought they were out for longer because they, they don't like that fence. Now they they come back to the door and Came sulk. The concrete. Oh, do they? They yeah. go to the fence and they come back here and solve? Yep. That's awesome. Yep. Oh, shit. That means it's working. <laughs> They're playing in the sandbox now. That's fine. I think everybody else has outgrown it. I have no problem with them <laughs> doing that. Diggy diggy hold. I need to find my... Oh, where would it be? I need to find my script. You can come along for the ride. Yeah. <sighs> All right, elementals. My computer's completely flummoxed. Like, what are you trying to do? Oh, no. Uh, eh. So, how's it going? Did you miss me? We're just uh, making some content. Yeah.